Good morning, church family. How are you? No, really. How are you? I mean, you look, you, you look great. I don't have my glasses on, but you look pretty good from up here. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you're here. I want to welcome those of you tuning in on Facebook Live or YouTube Live or any other electronic format. We're glad that you're with us. I'm so grateful that our champs is rocking and rolling over there along with all of our other children's ministries. In fact, let's pray for them. Yeah, let's pray for them right now. Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that you are a, a Savior who said, let the little children and come to me for such is the kingdom of heaven. And so we pray for our youth in their service right now. We pray for our kids ministry from top to bottom. And we thank you for the launch last weekend of our Champions Club. And we just pray for Alexis and her team that uh, your spirit would move through them to love on these kiddos in an amazing way and that they would know how special and uniquely loved they are by their creator. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we want to welcome you to week number 28 of our 40-week series through the Bible. And if you're new to Valley, you need to know this is a long series. We typically don't do series that last 40 weeks unless we're going through a book of the Bible, maybe, like a long book of the Bible. But uh, what we're doing is we're celebrating our 40-year anniversary. And so we thought, as a church, and so we thought that uh, it would be awesome to just go through the entire storyline of the Bible in 40 parts so that we could kind of all appreciate how the story all fits together. The Bible's a big book, and it can be confusing if you just don't know much about it, and you open it up, and you're like, where am I, right? I mean, I have a theological degree and a lot of training in the Bible, and unless I really am thinking about where I am, sometimes even for me, I can open up to a passage, and I have to go, okay, what's going on here? You know, so we want to know the story in its context so that we're not taking things out of context and misunderstanding or mis misusing the Bible, which happens in a lot of religion these days. Wouldn't you agree? So we don't ever want to abuse people with the Bible. And we, we feel like the Bible is the book that will, will God will use to set people free when they realize there's one hero in the Bible and his name is Jesus. And the entire story points us to him. Amen? And so if you haven't done so already, grab your Bibles and we're going to turn to the book of Matthew in just a minute. If you need a Bible, you can slip your hand up in the air. One of our ushers will bring one right to your seat. And over the past few weeks, we've been launching into the New Testament. About three weeks ago, I mentioned to you that Jesus came with two primary ministries. His first ministry was to take the law of God and to elevate it to, an, to the impossibly high standard that it really is. You know, God's plan was never that he would, he ever thought, he never thought we could keep the law. He didn't give us the law in order that uh, we might measure up to him, his standard, okay? He gave us the law actually to show us our need for Christ. Paul, the Apostle Paul said that the law is our schoolmaster or our tutor leading us to our desperate realization, I need grace, I need Christ. Now, the law is good, it's holy. The problem was not with the law, but the problem was with us because we were sinners. We inherited sin from our earliest ancestor, Adam. And so uh, there's a problem. The law is perfect, but we cannot attain to the law. And there were a lot of people in Jesus' day who were kind of doing the outward religious regimens to the point that they thought, hey, we're pretty good. You know, I'm keeping the law, right? I, I'm doing pretty good. And they were self-righteous and they were looked down their no, looking down their noses at other people, uh, creating these spiritual hierarchies. Well, I'm better than them because I do this better. So Jesus comes with an elevation of the law and he says, oh yeah, you think you keep the law of God pretty well. You've heard it said such and such, but I say to you, and he takes the law and he ratchets it up so that he's burying them under the impossibility of actually keeping it. It's genius. And then after there's this elevation of the law, Jesus' second ministry is a proclamation of liberty. A proclamation of liberty where he says, hey, there's only one way to, to, to be accepted by God, and it's not through law keeping, it's through faith in my finished work on the cross. And so that was uh, what, what, what the, the direction, the trajectory that Jesus' ministry was, ministry was pointing people. So I, I shared that with you a few weeks ago. Then two weeks ago, Pastor Isaac did a fantastic job taking us into the first chapter of John and talking about the deity of Christ, which was another way to say it's the godness of Christ, that Jesus Christ is fully man, and yet he's fully God without mixture in one person. And that's an amazing thing to think about, the word becoming flesh, the word, God himself becoming flesh and dwelling among us, walking among us full of grace and truth. And then last weekend for the launch of Champs, we had Chris Simning here. Wasn't that a phenomenal time with Chris? You can clap for that. It was awesome. Uh, and he shared with us 
Jesus, one of Jesus' many evidences uh, of, of the fact that he is God. By the way, he healed the blind man, I mean the lame man at the pool of Bethesda, right? And he related it to his own story. And as we see throughout all of the Gospels, Jesus substantiates his claim to be God by performing many, many miracles. But you get to a place eventually in John chapter 12 where John says this, even though Jesus did many miracles in the presence of all of these witnesses, there were still a lot of people who refused to believe in him, which shows you the, the, the hardness uh, that the human heart is capable of apart from the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. And so uh, what happens then is Jesus comes, he comes to offer his kingdom. By and large, his kingdom was rejected by, by Israel. Uh, and so he decides that he's going to introduce a new expression, and this was God's plan all along, a new form of his kingdom that he called the church. Now, the church is not the totality of the kingdom of God, but it is the current expression that God is bringing and manifesting elements of his kingdom through here on the earth. And so in Matthew 16, Jesus tells his disciples for the very first time, I will build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. And today we're going to focus our attention on what Jesus accomplished for us after he had done all of these many miracles and he had gone to the cross. He, he spent three years revealing himself as Messiah, proclaiming and demonstrating the gospel of the kingdom. But ultimately his greatest accomplishment, his greatest miracle was yet to come. Now, to set the scene, Jesus has just spent some final hours with his original disciples. He's been preparing them for the fact that he's about to leave, and they're having a tough time accepting and understanding what's about to take place. And you really can't blame them. These were men who had given three-plus years of their lives to following this rabbi who they believed to be the king who would usher in the kingdom that had been promised for many centuries to Israel. But Jesus introduces them to the reality that there was going to be, as I said, this unique phase, this unique expression of the kingdom called the church, the ecclesia in the Greek original language, from this compound word ek, meaning out from, and kaleo, meaning to call. The church is God's body of called out ones, where God calls us out from the world to be set apart for his glory and his purposes, and then on his mission sends us back into the world to call many, many millions more out with us. Isn't that amazing? And so as the story continues to emerge, we're going to discover as we get into the book of Acts next weekend that we are currently living as part of that expression of God's kingdom called his church. It's incredible to think that you and me are just as much a part of God's cast of characters as anybody, any man or woman that we've read about up to this point in the story. Isn't that, isn't that crazy to think about? That Adam, uh, Abraham, Moses, Joshua, David, right on down the line, we are just as much a part of God's story as they are, and yet our stories are still being written until the second coming of Jesus. We are a part of that cast of characters. And when we get into the letters of Paul in a few weeks, we're going to discover what it actually looks like to be part of the cast instead of just being content to be part of the audience. See, I fear that a lot of us as Christians are content to view ourselves as part of the audience. It's like we're at the event, right? We're, we're okay with that, but we don't see ourselves as being on the team. We may cheer from the stands. We may even fantasize about one day stepping onto the field or stepping onto the stage, but at the end of the day, we're fearful. We, we, we aren't so sure that we can handle this assignment, and so we'd just rather watch some Christian professionals do it all, right? Well, think of it this way. If you were at a sporting event, Okay, and, and you know, a lot of you, one of the things you don't like about me is that I'm, I'm an L.A. fan. Dodgers, Lakers, you know, come on, go give me the, uh, okay. And, and so, but, but let me, I'm so culturally relevant that I'm going to use an analogy that will relate to you, okay. Imagine you're at a Giants game. Okay, and Mad Bum is on that. Mad Bum is on that is on that mound, right? Or, or imagine you're at a Warriors game and Steph Curry's doing his thing. Or imagine you're at a Niners game. Let's step back to the '80s, when back when I actually respected the Niners. And and uh, you know Joe Montana's backing up and he's hitting Jerry Rice, threading that needle, right? Imagine you're at this sporting event. Okay, and, and you're loving it. You're cheering and, and, and you're just in awe of this talent of these great athletes. And all of a sudden, the coach walks up in the stands. He says, hey, you, hey, come here. You're like, me? 
Yeah, yeah, you, come here. Listen, I'm going to need you, you're not going to believe this, but I'm going to need you to suit up. I need you to get down there on the field or on the court. What are you going to do? What are you going to say? Like, no way, right? I mean, you might fantasize about being down there when you're in the safety of the bleachers, but when that coach tells you to suit up and get on the field, you're like, wait a minute, I'm not ready for that. Like, I love the sport, but I'd rather just sit back here and cheer somebody on. Okay, but then imagine this. What if after all your stubborn refusal, what if the coach says to you, no, 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 you you don't understand. Listen, the moment you suit up, you are going to be infused with the spirit and the power of Mad Bum or Joe Montana or Steph Curry or pick your favorite, right? In other words, all of their knowledge and skill and talent and ability and confidence is going to be instantly transferred to you. The moment you suit up, you're going to have everything you need to succeed. Now, if that were the case, you'd probably still be a little freaked out, right? Okay, I'm going to have to see this uh, to believe it, but, but you'd, you'd be more likely to consider it. And if the sports analogy doesn't work for you, then use whatever you want. Maybe it's your favorite singer on a stage. Maybe it's your favorite actor in a movie. Maybe it's your favorite performer in a Broadway musical. Whatever the case, if you knew for certain that you would be infused with all of the qualities that you admire in them, then and only then could you muster the courage to step out in faith, one baby step after another. Well, in reality, this is parallel to what Jesus is communicating to his disciples on the final night, he's with them. He's saying, gang, listen, up to this point, you've been basically on the sidelines. You've been in the bleachers watching me do it all. But now I'm gonna ask you to suit up. You're gonna be clothed in my uniform. And the moment that happens, my spirit is going to infuse your spirit and you will take the field in a whole new way. Not in place of me, but empowered by me. So Jesus begins to tell his guys about the ministry of the Holy Spirit's power and presence and about how unless and until he leaves, he cannot send the spirit of truth. He says, which is in you, with you already, but he will be in you. He's telling them, I'm going to come live inside of you by the spirit of truth. And he tells them the secret to success on the field or on the stage of life is to abide in him the way a branch abides in the vine, trusting him to live his otherwise impossible supernatural life in you and through you. See, that's the Christian life. It's not that you can live it. It's that he can live it through you. But none of this would be able to happen unless and until Jesus inaugurates this new covenant that we've been talking about, where we get the new heart and the new spirit within us forever united to his Holy Spirit. And because of the severity of the sin of humanity that was in, it, what we inherited from our earliest ancestor, Adam, Christ's inauguration of the new was going to need to be a violent, gruesome mess. Many of you know the story, and you realize that Jesus goes through an excruciating several days leading up to his death at the Passover. He's betrayed by one of his closest followers into the hands of his enemies. He's deserted by his closest friends, all but one couple, his mom and his best friend John, at the foot of the cross. Before that, he's, he's illegally tried and unjustly found guilty. He's stripped naked, he's humiliated, he's tortured for hours on end, and then he's nailed to this cross with the worst of criminals. A couple of years before I was born, there was a book. Some of you might remember this. It was called Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Anybody remember that book? I loved it. I mean, I remember still some of it today. I read it as a kid. Alexander gets up and he, he, he has gum in his hair. And then he trips over his skateboard, right? And then he finds out, he goes to school and his, finds out his mom forgot to put dessert in his lunch. You know, some, some big deal for a second grader or whatever. And, and then he goes to the dentist later and he's got a cavity. I mean, Alexander's day is just not going well. And you know, people of all ages love that book because it reminds us that life throws us curveballs. Life gets in the way of our plans. And trials, both large and small, are going to be a part of our human experience in a sin-scarred world. Well, it would obviously be a bit of an understatement to say that the day of Jesus' arrest was indeed, from a human perspective, a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. 
And yet, as you read through the gospel accounts of Jesus' arrest and his trial and his humiliation and eventual crucifixion, you begin to see that in the midst of this horror, watch this now, you begin to see something incredible. You begin to see, ironically, that Jesus is the only one who's actually in control. Jesus is the only one who's actually in control. And he shows us this over and over again. There's one part where he looks his enemies in the eyes as he's carrying the cross and he says, hey, newsflash, nobody takes my life from me, but I willingly lay it down of my own accord. He looks Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor in the face, and he says this, you would have no power over me unless it were given to you from above. And as the Gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John beautifully recount the story from four unique vantage points, we are given a synopsis of some of the most powerful words ever spoken as Jesus initiates the launch of this new covenant and this new community that he was about to build called his church. This new arrangement that he's making between himself and not just Israel, but all of humanity from every race, tribe, tongue, and nation of the world. And as we reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus today and all that it accomplished, I think it is fitting for us to consider those seven precious phrases that proceed from the mouth of the King of Kings as he hung there in our place. Theologians have for centuries debated uh, about the actual order that these words would have come from his mouth. And for our purposes today, we're not so concerned with the chronology uh, as we are with reflecting on what the words themselves say about his amazing work that he accomplished for us. So I invite you to follow with me on your outline and in your Bibles as we briefly consider these seven powerful statements one by one, which again are Jesus' final seven statements from the cross. We're going to begin in Matthew 27 and Mark 15, where it records this, both of those accounts record this same phrase, Jesus utters these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You think about it, those are truly some of the most shocking words in all of Scripture. When you understand the breadth of what the Scriptures teach about the union of the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when you consider that the Son for all eternity had shared in co-equal glory with the Father and the Spirit, and now to see Him hanging on earth in our place and actually experiencing that hellish nightmare of feeling abandoned by God, we truly begin to see what the Scriptures mean by the fact that He is our substitute. This is why we use, and the scripture uses these terms, like he died for us. He died in our place. He is literally exchanging positions with us because we all know what it feels like to feel abandoned by God, even though he's never abandoned us. But our emotions, man, they're, 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 they fluctuate, don't they? We, 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 we ride these emotional roller coaster rides of the soul. And we sometimes feel abandoned by God. And this incredible statement showcases the truth about what was front and center in the mind of Christ as he hangs there in our place. For starters, number one, you can jot this down. He was focused, even in the midst of his worst agony, he was focused on our fellowship being restored to the Father. See, that Jesus experienced this sense of abandonment means that he's able to empathize with us whenever we feel this way. When God first created Adam and placed him in the garden, Adam was designed to enjoy unbroken intimacy and fellowship with his creator. But when Adam sinned, that sweetness of unbroken fellowship, it tells us, it began to break down. It's not that God had turned his back on humanity, it's that humanity had turned his back on God. And as a fallen humanity, we deserve for him to turn away from us, but he never would. In fact, God does just the opposite. It's Adam who's trying to hide from God, trying to cover his own nakedness with his own means. And God pursues Adam. Where are you, Adam? I love you, Adam. I don't want this distance between us, Adam. Don't cover yourself. Let me cover you. Let me protect you. Let me rescue you. Jesus brings us back into fellowship with God. And, and, and as, he, as he bears that, that sense of isolation on our behalf during those brutal hours on the cross. You see, this reality reminds us of a very important theological term. It's an old school word, but I, think, I don't think we should dumb stuff down, you know, 
for today. I think everybody today, if, if anything, we're, we're as intelligent as we've ever been. It's just sometimes we live in a soundbite culture where we don't connect the dots as well as previous generations, maybe, perhaps, in some ways. But let's not forget that there are these incredible biblical words that have power and meaning, not just for intellectual enjoyment, but for daily life and the quality of our experience between ourselves and God. This word I want to focus on for a moment is the word propitiation. See, because Jesus actually became sin for us, The Father's wrath against sin was fully satisfied by Jesus so that we would never have to pay that debt ourselves. And because all of our sin, past, present, and future, was placed upon Jesus, all the blame, all the guilt, all the shame, we now get to experience propitiation. Propitiation means that the holy wrath of God that he rightly held against our sin as the judge of the universe has been fully appeased, fully paid for by the sacrifice of Jesus. You've heard me tell you over and over again that God is not mad at you. I'm not just saying that because I'm trying to, you know, exercise the power of positive thinking. I'm saying that because the New Testament teaches that from start to finish. In 1 John chapter 2 verse 1, we're assured this, dear children, I write these things to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Verse 2, listen to this, he is the atoning sacrifice. That word is literally propitiation. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of what? The whole world. Because Jesus was willing to exchange places with us on the cross, we have the promise that God is fully satisfied by the payment he made on our behalf. And because God's wrath against sin has been fully satisfied, you and I, this is really good news, you and I will never experience God turning his face away from us. Ever. Not ever. In fact, even when we sin, God is right there with us. He's grieved for us because he knows we're hurting ourselves or hurting someone else. He's not mad at us. Man, if that were all we had to go home with today, we could just rejoice for like a thousand lifetimes, couldn't we? Just with that. But that's only one of the seven things recorded for us in terms of what Jesus said from the cross. A second thing, quickly, you can jot down. As Jesus hung there naked and humiliated, he was focused on our forgiveness being secured. Now, in the midst of this pain and humiliation, as the crowd before him is hurling insults and accusations, Jesus cries out almost unbelievably these words, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. This familiar term to forgive literally means to let go of the right to repay someone for an offense. And God's forgiveness for us is so complete, so thorough, that he will not stop at simply letting go of his right to punish us. Okay, I mean, if that were all he did, if he were to take our negative account balance and bring us up to neutral, that would have been kind enough. But not only does he let go of our sin, but he goes so far as to implement another irreversible act of our salvation, and it's a word that's translated justification, that we are justified before a holy God. In the context of eternal life, in the legal sense, this word means to declare a person righteous. Now, Jesus, God, Jesus said there's only one righteous person, and that is God. So if we've been declared righteous, and if we've been made righteous by the righteousness of Christ, that means that through the righteousness of Christ, we are now good enough for God. Isn't that amazing? We are good enough for a holy God. In the ancient medical world, it referred to the resetting of a bone that was broken or made crooked. In other words, all of our crookedness has been corrected and reset into perfect alignment with the righteousness of the perfect Son of God, Jesus Christ himself. We talk a lot about forgiveness at Valley because forgiveness erases our negative account balance, bringing us up to neutral. But then God goes a a gigantic step further as he actually credits the, the infinitely positive account balance of Jesus into our account in such a way that he considers us to be just as righteous as Jesus is. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but that's a good deal. That's a good deal. That's what it means to be justified. 
And that account can never be overdrawn by our sin, by our doubt, by our mistakes, or whatever the case may be. This is why we can rest assured that we can never out the grace of God. This is an amazing transaction that takes place. Not only are we forgiven and justified, but as Jesus pours out his blood for us, we see that he's also focused on a third thing, and that is our faith being exercised. Our faith being exercised. Watch this. Then the story of the thief on the, on the cross is probably you know, one of a hundred different New Testament examples of the fact that faith alone is the only way to receive the free gift of eternal life. We can't earn it. We can't merit it. We can't deserve it. We can't win it. We can only receive it for the gift that it is by grace through faith. And that's exactly what happens to the guy, one of the guys hanging next to Jesus. There were two of them. And the first guy begins to taunt Jesus, almost sarcastically, angrily crying out, hey, Jesus, if you're really who you say you are, why don't you pull yourself off the cross and rescue all of us? The other thief, understanding that he deserved to be punished for his sins, for his crimes, he realizes Jesus holds his eternal destiny in his hands. And he groans out to the Savior, Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. He simply places faith in both Christ's authority and Christ's ability to rescue him. And Jesus whispers this third statement in response to his faith. I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Again, this story of the thief on the cross totally eradicates any doubt about whether a person can earn their way into God's acceptance. This guy couldn't perform any good works if he tried. I mean, he couldn't be baptized. He couldn't memorize a catechism. He couldn't go to confirmation. He couldn't ascribe to a theological belief system. He couldn't exercise any of his spiritual gifts. He couldn't give any money to charity or go on a mission trip or teach a Sunday school class. He could only simply believe. And that was enough. A few years later, Acts chapter 16, verse 31, Paul and Silas are in jail, right? And God sends this earthquake and the, the jail crumbles down and the jailer's freaking out. And he comes to Paul and Silas. He says, what must I do to be saved? And how do Paul and Silas respond? Do they say, well, you better be baptized. Make sure you get that checked off. <laughs> you better keep the commandments. That's what you've got to do. How about this? Go sell all you have and give it to the poor. Didn't Jesus say something about that? Hey, straighten your life up. No, they didn't say any of that. They simply said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. When Jesus interacts with the thief on the cross, he's focusing the attention on what it truly means to have faith in him. Faith is simply believing, trusting, placing total confidence in him alone apart from any other means to rescue us from sin. The fourth thing at the heart of Jesus' focus on the cross was our Father being glorified. I want you to see this. As Jesus is hanging there, the text says that the time is about noon. And again, we're not looking at these phrases in necessarily chronological sequence, but we're concerned with what they reveal about the heart of Jesus as he died in our place. And they reveal some amazing things about what his blood accomplished for us. Now listen, for Jesus, all of life was about worship. All of life was worship. It wasn't an hour that you spent on Sundays or whatever, right? All of life was about loving and glorifying the Father. For he, you know, he set such an incredible example for us. An incredible example when, when, when at his worst moment imaginable, you think about this, as every last ounce of his physical strength and energy is depleting from his body, he says in essence, Father, I trust you. Into your hands I commit my spirit. No matter what is going on in this horrific circumstance, I trust you. See, obedience glorifies God. And what Christ's obedience reveals is the level at which he trusted the Father. You know, in a series like this where we're so focused on the grace of God, and I'm always focused on the grace of God because it is the heart of the message of Christianity. I mean, without grace, Christianity is just another religion. Every religion believes in a holy God. Every religion believes in a merciful God. Every religion believes in a loving God. Only Christianity promotes a gracious God. Grace is unique to Christianity. 
Yeah, you can clap for that. I'd like an amen once in a while too, because I worked hard on this and I know it's true, all right? I need some, I need some, a cheering section here. Listen, listen, here's the thing. People will say, you know, in a series like this, where we're talking about, you know, so, the grace of God, the goodness of God and all of that. And people will say, you know, well, well uh, when are you going to talk about obedience, Pastor Jeremy? <laughs> you know, isn't obedience important? When are you going to get to the issue of discipleship? Of course obedience is important. In fact, every time I talk about the goodness of God, the grace of God, the gospel of Jesus and how it applies to daily life, I am talking about obedience. Because did you realize the Bible says that it's God's kindness that leads a person to repentance? The Bible says it's the grace of God that teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly and righteously and godly in the present age. The Bible says that we, we are no longer held slaves to sin precisely because we are no longer under law, but under grace. Every sermon you ever hear is about obedience. I'm just not beating you up. That's the difference. Some of you want to get spanked every week when you come to church. You're not going to get that here. I'm going to trust that the Holy Spirit is going to take the goodness of God and apply it to your hearts in such a way that you live a transformed life because he's the Holy Spirit and I'm not. I'm not a very good Holy Spirit. I don't want to be the Holy Spirit. But my honor and my privilege as your pastor is never to whip you into shape, but to constantly lead you to the good shepherd over and over and over and over again because we're forgetful people. And when I, when I hand you off to him, he's the one. He's the one who will gently work within your spirit. Never to expose or embarrass you, but to protect you and to build you up. Security leads to maturity. Never the other way around. Maturity is not possible apart from security. You will never walk in obedience to someone that you don't trust. And on the cross, Jesus demonstrates for us the fact that it's impossible, or that it is possible, rather, for a person to remain secure in God even through the worst imaginable trials of life. But this reality is only in connection with our understanding of God's irreversible commitment to us. Jesus told us that in this life we will have trouble. He didn't say it might happen. He said it would happen. But he also said that we could take heart and be filled with joy because he's overcome the world. And he's in charge of his universe. And he empathizes with us in our pain and our suffering. Why? Because he walked in our shoes. So Jesus is reflecting this reality from the cross when in the midst of this excruciating physical and emotional and spiritual torment, he cries out, I, I trust you. He's focused on glorifying the Father when the crowds are yelling, where's your God now? If you're really the Son of God, pull yourself off that cross and prove it. See, obedience glorifies God, and that's what Jesus was proving to us from the cross. But it's not a burdensome obedience. In the context of the new covenant life, obedience is simply walking in grateful response to God's amazing grace and trustworthiness and goodness and kindness in our lives. All of life is worship. The question is, which deity are you worshiping? Right? I mean, everyone in this room, everyone listening online, everyone is a worshiper. In fact, it's the one thing you were born without, you didn't need any practice. You're good, right from you, the time you come out of the womb. You were created to be a worshiper. The question is, and I don't care if you're an atheist, you're a worshiper. The question is, which God are you worshiping? Is it something phony like power or money or reputation or influence? Or are we worshiping the sovereign creator who has proven himself so trustworthy that he would rather come and die? and live without us? That's the question. Your worship is only as good as the reliability of the God you're worshiping. A fifth reality Jesus highlighted from the cross was his focus on his family being restored. We'll have to move through these quickly, but moving into John chapter 19, verse 26, Jesus looks down at his grieving mother and his bewildered friend John, and he says to Mary, dear woman, here is your son, and to John, the other disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple, John, took her, Mary, 
into his home. See, one of the things Jesus reveals from the cross is that he is instituting a brand new family that would extend beyond our physical genetic ties. And the rest of the New Testament reveals this to be true. The Apostle Paul would later teach us that this church, this ecclesia, was to be a family formed of every race, every tribe, every tongue, every nation of the world. And we come to understand that the family of God is not determined by our physical DNA, but rather our spiritual DNA as a body of those who simply believe in Jesus and in his sacrifice on the cross. Way back at the beginning of the year, I pointed out to you what the Bible reveals, that there are only two families that actually live on planet Earth. Did you realize that? There's only two families. There's the family of those who are in the first Adam, and there are the family of those who live in the last Adam. The first Adam and the last Adam, that's it. And that's what salvation, that's what eternal life is all about, where God graciously moves you from that condemned, sinful family of the first Adam to this born-again, righteous, new covenant family of the last Adam. That's the deal. That's the offer. I can't believe humanity has, has, has screwed up the simplicity of this message for so many centuries by piling human religion on top of things. Mary had been raised a peasant girl from Nazareth. You think about that. John was a commercial fisherman from Galilee. They, both of them are Jews, but that's all they have in common. Prior to, prior to connection that, 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 that they were given through Jesus, they hardly had anything in common. And now Jesus is saying, hey, this is your mother and this is your son. We may be in this room, we may be brothers from other mothers, sisters from other misters, whatever you want to say, but we have the same heavenly father he created us with uniqueness and diversity but at the same time has united us even in that diversity we don't all look the same way we don't all worship the same way we don't all serve the same way we don't all uh, uh, talk the same way but we're one as the body of Christ and Jesus is focused on making that known from the cross number six quickly Jesus was focused on his faithfulness to our humanity see Jesus never once ceased to be God when he was in his human body. And yet from the cross, we see that he was just as human as he was divine. He's described in Hebrews 4 as a priest who empathizes with our weaknesses and has been tested in every way as we are and yet remained without sin. In John 19, 28, Jesus says, I, listen to this, I am thirsty. After which the guards soak a sponge in vinegar, and they jam the sour, bitter substance into his mouth to mock him. Hydration is the most basic element of human survival. Right? We cannot uh, live without water. We can live a while without food, but we cannot live very long at all without water. So imagine the God of the universe subjecting himself to our human experience in such a way that, that, that he would know what it felt like to be gasping for our most basic earthly sustenance. His faithfulness to endure the suffering of our human condition is seen so vividly as he surrenders himself to the realities of hunger and pain and thirst and fear and weakness and frailty that are part and parcel to being human. This is the guy who can turn water into wine. He can turn stones into bread, for crying out loud. He commands the, the wind and the waves to obey him. And not only does he control weather patterns, he can take five loaves and two fish and feed thousands. And yet he, the man who could have commanded a cloud to come over his head and dump water into his mouth, he never uses those superhuman abilities as a free ticket to escape suffering. He's faithful to live and surrender to the same frailties that we experience. A horrible, terrible, no good, very bad day. Until, until in his final words, 
We find an allusion to a ray of hope on the horizon. Verse 30 says, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And darkness at that moment permeated the atmosphere. Jeers from all the haters gathered round. Tears from that small group of close friends who stood by. But in that darkness, a ray of hope. See, apparently something was happening at a deeper level here. Jesus is revealing a final concern that he had from the cross. And you can jot this down. Finally, number seven, the fulfillment of his mission. Man, I would give almost anything to have had a transcript of the thoughts that were racing through the minds of those Roman guards and those religious Jews who had just witnessed this whole thing go down. I mean, they had heard him make these statements all along. Hey, nobody's taking my life from me. I just want you to know I'm willingly giving it. They had heard him say, or at least the rumor had gotten out that he'd looked Pilate in the face and said, hey, you'd have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Those words had to be ringing in their ears. It is finished. What in the world is it? (laughs) What does it mean? Who's really in charge here? And Jesus was answering in no uncertain terms. I'll tell you who's in charge. I am. Beginning next week, we'll be getting a glimpse of the book of Acts and we'll be highlighting what happens when the power of Christ's resurrection confirms that his words from the cross are true. It is finished. And we'll see how the completion of Christ's earthly mission becomes the launch pad for our mission as his ambassadors of this amazing grace. As those who suit up and take the field clothed with Christ and infused with the power and the presence of his Holy Spirit. Next weekend as well, as as, uh, uh, Isaac mentioned earlier, we're hosting yet another guest speaker in celebration of our 40th anniversary. His name's Kevin Compelin, and he serves as president of the Evangelical Free Church of America. It's our denomination. We are united, of course, cross-interdenominationally with everybody who trusts in Jesus. But our particular denomination is a fellowship of about 1,500 plus churches across the United States and thousands more around the world. And we're grateful to be able to join together with other like-minded churches in global endeavors to see the gospel go forward and to to feed the poor and heal the sick and all of those things that God has called us to do corporately. And he's going to, as we launch into the book of Acts, he's going to talk about what God's church is capable of when we're living in radical dependence upon the Holy Spirit. But let me just close our time today by asking, aren't you thankful, you guys, aren't you thankful that obedience to God under the new covenant is not a burdensome religious regimen? Man. New life is about believing in Jesus and loving one another. That's the summary that Jesus' closest earthly friend, the only one who stood the full length at the foot of the cross, the only disciple who didn't abandon Jesus, wrote these words. He said, and this is his command. And then he gives this two-part command. To believe in the name of the one he sent... And to love one another, even as he has loved us. Faith and love married together in our lives. And what's great is that faith and love are impossible apart from radically depending upon him. And so that relationship of just naive, guilt-free Loving dependence that we had back in the Garden of Eden before Adam messed it up. The gospel returns us to that quality of life before this God. Freedom from law. Freedom from sin. Freedom from religious rules and regulations. And all of that replaced by an irreversible, unconditional relationship with our Creator. And it's all made possible through the cross and the empty tomb. And so I would just ask, if you're here today and you don't really know where you stand with God, I don't know your backstory. Some of you I do, but many of you I don't. I don't know what burdens or what wounds from the past you carry in here. Maybe you've had church people hurt you. I'm so sorry for that. 
Maybe your view is that, well, the church is just, for, it's just filled with a bunch of crip, hypocrites. You know, I've heard that. And I just got to say, I agree with you. That's why we came to Jesus. Because without him, we, we're all hypocrites. We don't even measure up to our own ideals, much less God's, apart from him. I believe you're here today because God loves you enough to tell you, hey, I'm after you. Just like I came after Adam when he was trying to hide from me and cover his own exposure. I'm after you. Where are you today? And I'm after you in the best possible sense of the word. I'm not after you to embarrass you. I'm not after you to expose you. I'm not after you to shame you. I'm not after you to condemn you. I'm not after you because I want your money. Not your money anyway. I'm after you because I love you. And I want to embrace you and I want to protect you. And I want you to learn what it means to enjoy me. Because I'm not calling you to be part of a religious club. I'm calling you into a family. Would you just bow with me as we close in prayer? And as just everyone, just, just set our minds on the Father for a moment. And if you came into this place feeling disconnected from God because you've never known what it means to have a relationship with Him, I'm telling you, it, it's this simple. Talk with Him. You say, I don't, I don't know everything that I need to know about him. That's okay. You don't, you don't know everything about the humans that you have, are friends with as a prerequisite for entering into a relationship with them. Why would you need to? It's, it's, an, it's a lifetime of learning more and more about who this God is. You don't have to know it all right now. Just know this. He loves you unconditionally. And he loved you so much that he would rather die than live without you. He didn't just tell you that he loved you. He proved it by coming to get you. There's no other belief system. There's no other faith in all the universe with a God who did that for you. So just talk to him. Just say, Jesus, I don't have it all figured out. But I guess that's why I need you. I need you to forgive me of all my sins. I need you to give me your new life through the power of your resurrection and the Holy Spirit. I believe that you died on a cross and were raised from the dead for my sins. And help my unbelief. From this day forward, in fact on this day, September 15th, 2019, I declare that I'm moving from the family of Adam to the family of Jesus, that I'm a new creation, bought and paid for at the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, man, I would love to know about it. I'm not going to ask you any invasive questions or anything, but if you'll just communicate that with me on the way out as you leave today, I'd love to know just your first name so I could pray for you. If you need a Bible, man, as you might expect, I got a stack of Bibles I can give away. I'll, I'll give you a Bible. Um, and, and if you have any questions about the ministries at Valley Church, we'd love to help you on this journey. We're a family of non-judgmental people who are here to surround you with the grace and truth of Jesus and invite you into community. And I promise we're not here to point our fingers at you. We're here to point you to Jesus over and over and over again. And if anybody at this church treats you any differently, you come talk to me, okay? And I'll have a little side convo with them. <laughs> Let me pray one more time. Father, thank you that we get to give and close out our time together this weekend, responding to your goodness with a gift of our own. We thank you that this is not a have-to thing, that this is a get-to thing. We get to join you at your invitation. We get to join you in participating in what you're doing, not just in and through Valley, but throughout our community and around the world. 
And so we give in glad and we give with glad and, and, and sincere hearts, not not under compulsion, but with joy. And this portion of what you've blessed us with that we have set aside to give back to you. We ask you'd take it and you'd multiply it like fish and loaves on the shores of Galilee, that thousands and millions more would be able to come into an understanding of you. We ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people agreed and said, amen. I love you, Valley Church.